Hello and welcome to the Canmar Morning Talk Show. As always, I'm your host, Louis, and today's guest is Andrew Branch, a cannabis counselor and band member of the reggae band Halfway Tree. In this interview, Andrew and I discuss the role cannabis plays in creative endeavors, as well as how the plant can bring our body into a state of homeostasis thanks to our endocannabinoid system. Doing so can help us alleviate illnesses such as anxiety, insomnia, and much more. I hope you enjoy this interview with Andrew Branch as part of the Canmar Morning Talk Show. Okay, we are live on the Canmar Morning Talk Show with Andrew Branch. Andrew, how are you going? Very well, thank you. Um, we were just talking about uh, uh, coming to you from, from Eastern Canada, where uh, I live in a province called Nova Scotia on uh, the easternmost part of Canada. And um, we've managed to keep the COVID numbers uh, very low, mostly at bay. Um, so we've actually been able to still gather in uh, sort of in socially distanced groups. Um, so we were actually able to play a concert on the weekend. Um, wow. It, it was a, it, it's, it's, I'd say the primary live music venue in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And uh, the capacity is about 600. So they were only allowed to sell 110. Everyone had to be seated. Um, but just to be able to get out and play live uh, during these COVID times was a real treat. It was just wonderful to be able to flex those muscles and, uh, and create some Irie reggae music, you know? Mm, mm. Well, I know Canada is doing it a little bit tough for other parts of Canada, at least. Yeah. Uh, how long has it been since you did a gig? Uh, well, we played at that same venue the beginning of February. Uh, we did like a Bob Marley tribute on his birthday um, and then booked the club again for last weekend and uh which we it was it's an annual event that we call reggae splash um so that was pretty awesome but before that it's been a year since we were able to uh to congregate and play so it was a treat wow yeah and you have a band called halfway tree which is a jamaican band reggae band it's a reggae band where did you get this where'd you get this influence from uh well i grew up in toronto ontario um uh which has a vast jamaican population and uh after my parents divorced when i was little my mom dated a black jamaican economics teacher at her high school at the high school that she worked at and so he started coming around and he was a a, a major influence on my life he was um really involved in social justice issues and uh, they developed uh, they developed a network called uh, Educators for Nuclear Disarmament. Um, so those were major influences to me as, as a youth. And um, once I discovered Bob Marley's music, there was no turning back. Yeah. And what age did you start playing music? Well, um, I guess in it's around grade four or five where they start teaching you how to play recorder. And, mm. uh, in, and then in grade five, I, I realized that the saxophone is actually the same fingering as the recorder. So I transitioned to saxophone and, and started learning that. I, I studied that throughout high school. So for about 13 years or so. Um, and along the way, my mom bought a piano and put it in our house and I started tinkering away on that and uh starting to write songs and so on so um yeah so i guess around the age of 15 i really dug into the piano and uh, put together my first group and uh again being in toronto i i started recruiting some of the jamaican musicians in in town and uh by the time i left toronto and moved here to halifax i was working with the top Jamaican reggae musicians in Canada. So the band was just incredible. And uh, since I moved... And then when was that? How long has the band been around? Uh, we just celebrated our 25th anniversary, actually. 
Wow. Yeah. So that, wow. that's pretty exciting. Um, so, so for those of you that are interested, there's, uh, on our website, there's our, our whole catalog of music, but there's also an album that represents 25 years of sort of greatest hits there available as well. So that's crazy. Well, I've, I was speaking about this off air, but I've just picked up the guitar on my 25th anniversary of being alive right on. <laughs> and it does, it does not come naturally to me. I don't know if it, it must to some people. Right. Did you find that music was kind of, it, it just was like a second language to you or was it very difficult for you to pick up? Uh, well, I felt like it was, it, it was a, a natural inclination, I guess. Um, but yeah, I've certainly met people that, it, that playing the guitar or even the piano or what have you comes really naturally. Some people can almost pick up any instrument and just go for it. But, uh, but no, you definitely have to be patient and, uh, and committed and, the thing about artists, right, is is we are we feel compelled to sit in a room by ourselves for hours and hours and hours, whether we're writing or we're practicing an instrument or whatever. So, it's a pretty reclusive uh, sport, if you will. You know. Yeah. Mm. And then, obviously, to segue into cannabis, obviously, reggae and cannabis have this kind of marriage, yeah. this kind of cultural and historical marriage. Why is that? And is this how you found your way into cannabis? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, well, I mean, if, if we if we trace the roots back to Africa and the slave trade that brought slaves from Africa to Brazil and then spread across the Caribbean for sugarcane production and so on, um, there came African traditions, particularly drumming. Um, Jamaican history is famous for uh, a group of of, uh, of slaves that managed to retreat to the hills of Jamaica and hide out from the British. And really, they had a stronghold where they successively stood off against the British army called the Mar uh, this the group of, of Jamaicans were called the Maroons um, so uh, as far as I can tell the Rastafarian faith was born out of that uh, out of the Maroons um, where they were playing drums in the hills and chanting uh, praise to the great spirit and uh, and cannabis uh, had been exported I think it arrived in Jamaica in the 1500s thereabouts, and um, and it was an ideal growing condition for for growing cannabis in Jamaica. So, um, you know the the Hindu culture that is also present in Jamaica at one point brought ganja seeds to Jamaica and it flourished there, and then that sort of naturally became part of the Rastafarian faith wherein Rastas regard smoking ganja as a sacrament um, to get more in touch with, with the great spirit, with God, if you will, you know. So um, so I think that's sort of the lineage uh, of, uh, of how ganja um, became integral with Rastafarian culture and faith uh, through which uh, music became a part uh, namely praising the most high. And, uh, so yeah, thereby, um, ganja and Jamaican culture became, uh, you know, one and the same. So. And then was it through your kind of reggae musical influences and your mother's partner at the time? Was that kind of what drew you to cannabis? Like, how did you find cannabis? In your life well uh when i was mucking around downtown toronto and starting to frequent the reggae clubs and so on um where the rastafarians would be hanging out playing music listening to music there would be ganja everywhere you know it's again it's such an integral part of the culture uh, and i i suppose i was exposed to it there um, and then as I 
really delved into the reggae genre um, and started inviting Jamaicans around, then, you know, you'd get high and you'd make music and it was like, like nothing else. I mean, since I've, I've really gone into the, the cannabis industry uh, per se, um, you know, having studied it significantly, I, I've, you know, I, I became really interested in the fact that uh, THC in particular uh, stimulates our um, sensory cortices in the brain and, um, you know, creates heightened uh, or, or factory, olfactory uh, uh, perception and uh, where colors become more vivid and music sounds more awesome. So I think that's a real significant part of it too. And then if you add the fact that reggae music is this hypnotic polyphony of really easy rhythms um, and it becomes super hypnotic in of itself, I think that was born out of its uh, creators smoking weed um, and creating this beautiful hypnotic effect that, that reggae is famous for. So it's like the listeners being hypnotized. And then if you smoke herb and it's, you've got this heightened sensory perception, then it sounds even more hypnotic and the musicians that are creating it are kind of hypnotized. So it just becomes this amazingly hypnotic genre of music upon which uh, the lyrics were in praise of God or defending social justice or, or what have you. So it's powerful stuff, man. Mm, mm. And then is is cannabis kind of like a ritual for you when you're making music, when you're playing music? Like how integral is it now to your musical profession? Yeah, I, I consistently use it uh, in the creation process. Um, and I think also, you know, that 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 whole hypnotic cascade uh, is uh induced or heightened by cannabis for sure yeah yeah mm. and then what do you think the effects are because obviously there was the war on drugs which still continues to this right. day in most of the world what do you think the effects are clearly you're mentioning that cannabis has had this kind of uh union with reggae music and in, in many ways is inseparable from it mm -hmm. and it enhances the music and it helps to create the music. What do you think the effects are of not having this drug or different drugs as kind of tools for artists? Do you think this is kind of a deprivation in a sense? That's an interesting question. Um, well, I mean, the war on drugs has not been able to keep cannabis out of the hands of artists. And yes, I would agree that it, that it has, that it plays an integral role in, um, in inspiring those artists that bring themselves to the table that are willing to spend those hours by themselves in a room. Um, those of us that smoke or, or ingest or take cannabis on whatever level, know that uh, when you take cannabis in whatever form, it uh, facilitates a different thought process than you would have without it. So if we're talking about creativity, um, I kind of look at it as, as a conduit, like I'm the vessel through which I'm opening myself to receive inspiration from the ether or from the, the muse or from the great spirit or whatever you want to call it. Um, and cannabis is kind of opens this portal for this free flow of, of creative energy. That's the way I see it. Um, and in response to your question, um, you know, do I use it when I, when I, when I'm being creative? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, ha I have a song that, that people could listen to again on, on our website, which is halfwaytree.ca. Maybe you'll put that up or whatever, but um, a song called My Jamaican Weed, as you would have it. Um, and uh, in, in which in the song, I say I use it as a meditation and I use it when I make music and it's right in the lyrics. So 
So yeah, absolutely. Mm, well, Terence McKenna, the late Terence McKenna, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Uh, he was a uh, cannabis and psychedelic advocate. And he passed away in the early 2000s, but he was prolific. He was an author. And he actually believes that humans have a symbiotic relationship with these uh, hallucinogens and cannabis, psychedelics, and that actually many of our current anxieties stem from our detachment or our separation from these medicines or from our from our plant allies, as he called plant them. Plant allies, that's and, a term. Yeah, and it's it's very interesting to see that, you know, certain types of music are not only enhanced by cannabis, but in some cases may not exist in their current form or to their current level right. without cannabis. Right. And and I'm sure you could testify to that. So it's very interesting how like we have these kind of reciprocal relationships with these plants. It's not so much uh, abusive as I think a lot of governments might believe it is or authoritative bodies as it is reciprocal where you are gaining something from this plant and then you're releasing that out into the world for other people to enjoy. And I think you're a perfect example of that with Halfway Tree. Right. So it's it's awesome to see. Well, it's interesting you should say that. And at the risk of sounding like a uh, an older, responsible person, um, you know, part of, of, of the work that I do in the cannabis field wherein I – uh, guide clients to therapeutic doses of cannabis for healing purposes. Um, I, I think that we also should take care to use it responsibly because, um, you know, there are lots of people that, you, that, you know, that are referred to as chronics or whatever that, um, that just kind of smoke weed incessantly. And at some point it becomes, um, you know, at some point we just seek out that rush every day or we uh, remain, you know, we have a, there, there's an addictive nature uh, where the body is seeking out that high feeling again. And then, you know, it, there's, there's lots of advocates like Seth Rogen and Snoop Dogg and Willie Nelson that are just like, yeah, I'm high all the time. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so don't let me put anybody off. But what I'm saying is like, there's a dependency issue where do you, you know, at some point, are you disconnected from reality or um, are you using it therapeutically or are you using it to be creative or what have you, you know? Hmm. Well, let's, let's touch upon your work within cannabis. So you've, you describe yourself as a cannabis counselor. Is that yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. And what is that for audiences? Because, I mean, even being educated in cannabis in a formal sense is such a new concept right. that, you know, when people think of cannabis jobs, they think of dispensaries and bud tenders and growers. Yes. And now you have all these ancillary jobs stemming from the industry, right. such as being a cannabis counselor. And it's so interesting to me that all these jobs that, people wouldn't traditionally think of when they think of cannabis, right. you know, they might think of their drug dealer in the black market. Right, totally. So what is a cannabis counselor? And did you have to kind of craft this role for yourself? Or did you see people doing it and think I wanted to do that? Well, what happened with me is uh, I, I, uh, I married a massage therapist 10 years ago, and my wife founded a free alternative healthcare clinic for people living on a low income. So um, they were offering, it was basically a team of volunteers that got together and offered services like massage or acupuncture or uh, osteopathy, um, even nutrition. And so uh, at that point, I was uh, vo uh, volunteering as a, as a chef and cooking for the practitioners that volunteered their time. Um, and so at the end of a morning of treating people, everyone would gather around, all the practitioners would sit down and have a meal together. And at that time, I would 
hear their discourse and, and, and share in their stories about how wonderfully rewarding it was to treat people that otherwise wouldn't be able to afford these services, but were in desperate need or walking around in pain and what have you. So after I did that for over 10 years and um, at some point along the way, that really inspired me to turn my passion for cooking into uh, some type of career. So other than a chef, because I, I had worked as a bartender in restaurants for many years to support my music career. And I, I had witnessed the stress that chefs go through and I, I didn't want to go in that direction. Um, mm. But I did have a real passion for, for plants and plant-based foods and for cooking. So I ended up going to a school here in Canada called the Canadian School of Natural Nutrition, where I earned a diploma as a, a holistic nutritional consultant. So at that school, I learned anatomy and physiology and how food works in the body and breaks down and so on and so forth. And, you know, a lot about healing foods in terms of uh, treating various human conditions and uh, all the while making music. And um, at some point I answered an ad to, as a receptionist at a cannabis clinic. So this is not a dispensary, but an actual cannabis clinic um, where there would be a nurse or a nurse practitioner or, or a doctor in some cases on staff. Um, so people with various uh, medical symptoms, ailments would come to the clinic and see the nurse or doctor, get a medical prescription for cannabis, and then they would come and speak with an educator who was... Uh, who would teach them about how to take it, titration, dosing, that kind of stuff, how it's going to interact with their body. Um, and so after working on reception for a couple of months, they, they trained me as an educator and I became certified, a certified cannabis educator through this company. Um, and then they, uh, there a bunch of layoffs, <clears throat> beg your pardon, a bunch of layoffs happened when COVID hit a year ago. And then at that time, I uh, opened my own practice as a cannabis counselor. So effectively, what I do is meet with clients who are experiencing some type of medical illness um, and help guide them through how cannabis can be effective for various ailments. And then I will create a, a customized sort of personalized program in how much to take at what time of day in what dosage um, and in some cases what type of cannabis what strain may, might work best for them um, getting into the to the terpenes and so on and uh, yeah so it, it's it's been a, a an incredible journey I'm, I'm much more interested in the therapeutic side of things in the science Learning, the, learning and exploring the science of, of how cannabis works in the brain and throughout the body than I am in, you know, just being a bud tender, as you, uh, you know, alluded to there. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned kind of tailoring a cannabis plan, let's say, for a schedule for, you know, different ailments and different individuals. Mm -hmm. Are there any commonalities you see within those plans? Like, is there a certain time of day that cannabis use is optimal if people have certain conditions? Or does it really vary from person to person? It does. Um, it, it's really interesting. I mean, there's certain um, times of day and certain doses that, yeah, I mean, everybody's heard the moniker uh, start low and go slow, right? Um, that, mm. which is, I think, excellent advice because um, I think it's really important to introduce cannabis to the body, especially in somebody that is is cannabis naive or has no experience with it, um, to introduce it slowly so that one can sort of uh, reflect on, on how their body is responding to it. Um, it's really important to rule out any heart
the, the endocannabinoid system is, uh, is somewhat different in everybody. And the same therapeutic dose is not necessarily going to do the same thing in two different people. Um, so for that reason, I encourage people to keep a chart as they slowly increase their dosage to assess how their body is responding. Um, you know, somebody might respond really well and another person might not respond at all to the same dosage. So it seems to be really specific, um, compared to, you know, when you, when you look at people's individual bioenergetic makeup. So, mm, and do you think that like mentioning the kind of uniqueness of everyone and our endocannabinoid systems, would this also apply to traditional medicine? Do you think, do you think that I, this may not be like a relevant question, but do you think that there's kind of this one size fits all approach in, you know, traditional medicines, let's say, or established medicines that perhaps could be altered in terms of something more aligning with different individuals and their needs? Right. Or is it already kind of like that? Yeah, I would say I would say you raise a really good point. And the more research that's done on cannabis is the more the 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 medical and science world is realizing that, you know, these blanket fixes of giving people benzodiazepines and, and so on and, and opio, opioid painkillers and so on. It's just like a, a blanket fix that's that's certainly not into individual specific. Um, whereas cannabis, uh, you know, in therapeutic doses can, in many cases, be more effective than a, an opioid. Um, and, you know, just as a, for instance, I see lots of people with increased anxiety surrounding the pandemic. I mean, there's what I often call, you know, universal heightened anxiety going on. Um, so due to the fact that, uh, that, that cannabinoids can contribute to a reduction in anxiety, um, I'm able to help people like, you know, in some cases, to answer your question, some cases, uh, people will take it three times a day, morning, noon, and night kind of deal. And that will help to relax their nervous system and help them get through their day with a sense of calm. Um, people that might otherwise have this incredible anxiety that's somewhat paralyzing for them to even get through their day and cope, you know. Um, in other cases, maybe it's someone with chronic insomnia that might be stress release, uh, uh, stress um, associated with stress and anxiety that they can't sleep, they're lying awake feeling anxious or what have you. Um, and then maybe they'll just take a, a bit of CBD oil at night that helps them through uh, sleep through, or, you know, if the CBD by itself isn't working, then maybe we'll introduce a bit of THC in the mix or a balanced oil or what have you, um, to a point where people are getting the sleep that they need so that their body can rejuvenate and they can function, you know, uh, optimally throughout their day. And, and it's so rewarding, um, to, to speak with people who, uh, for whom cannabis is making a life changing difference, you know? Mm, mm, yeah, I definitely agree. And I've had the same privilege of having spoken to people who have PTSD, chronic anxiety, um, who are using opioids or who may have been reluctant to use opioids after seeing people they know and love kind of at least to to say the least they change on opioids and in some cases they become different people right. and obviously face the risk of addiction and fatality yes. and they turn to cannabis and in some cases it's let's say 80 percent as effective for chronic pain right. but you're cutting out all of these risks that are associated with uh, opioids that it's a win-win really like yeah, you're not getting the same level of numbness, but do you really want that, especially if it's coming at such a huge cost? Um, but something I wanted to ask you is, because you mentioned this like universal anxiety, uh, most of the people you see suffering from almost COVID-related stresses, or is it just a wide amalgamation of uh, different conditions? 
yeah i don't know that i would pinpoint that uh sort of broadly speaking um however i i think that it's at play in everyone right now i mean Mm. it's all everyone talks about (laughs) so if you're just inundated with the news or with vaccines or what are the case numbers or you know it's it's just pervaded our reality and contributed to universal anxiety whether people sort of want to address that or not so yeah i think it's it's just at play universally Mm. and then what what conditions would you say cannabis is best for in your experience like is there is there anything in particular like you mentioned insomnia is that like cannabis is great for insomnia or cannabis is really the best for chronic pain is there any kind of uh overlapping symptoms that you see like recurring symptoms and think these are kind of the main things that if you have it, cannabis is probably a a good option to think about. Well, it's interesting. You should say that because oftentimes I will meet with a client who is coming to me for one thing. Let's use anxiety as as an example. I'm having anxiety, but I also have digestive issues. So I help kind of coach them through, uh, a protocol that should help to relax the the nervous system and and uh, kind of combat anxiety and help people function. And then I'll meet with them a month later to see how it's going, and they will say, "Oh, my digestive issues have cleared up, and and so on, and I'm sleeping better." So many times, um, just by regulating the endocannabinoid system that's been stressed. Uh, will help a myriad of symptoms, which is the most rewarding thing to hear because you're helping somebody that's maybe coming to you with uh, insomnia. And so you help, help, I help guide them through a dose in the evening that helps them sleep better. But then all of a sudden, because they're sleeping better, their body is rejuvenating better and they're healing, or maybe they have less pain and inflammation. So yeah, I mean, it, it, I, to answer your question I, directly, I read a study recently um, with regards to uh, endocannabino- what, what they term endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome, um, and they are linking that to fibromyalgia, um, IBS, uh, so digestive issues, and migraine headaches. And uh, there, there's, it appears as though there is some uh, scientific evidence that's connecting a, an endocannabinoid deficiency with, with these uh, more and increasingly common um, disorders. So sometimes if you are helping to bring a person's endocannabinoid system into balance using phytocannabinoids, namely cannabis, um, they, 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 their self-regulating system is, is helping to, um, bring their body back into homeostasis and, uh, and, and a number of things sort of start to rebalance and, and, uh, and wellness occurs. So that's the angle that I'm really, that I'm really fascinated by the, the, the power of the cannabis plant for sure. Yeah, that that's pretty incredible. It just makes me wonder, as I was kind of saying before, like where we would be if the war on drugs never occurred. Right. And if, because one of the biggest, as I'm sure you've known, one of the biggest issues with the war on drugs was not just the criminalization of a naturally occurring plant, but it was this kind of catch-22 where because it was federally illegal in most countries, it was unable to be researched and it was actually research that could have disproven its scheduling, especially in America where it's scheduled as having no medicinal benefits. And it's pretty hard to disprove that if you're not allowed to research the plant. So hearing these studies that I hear almost on a weekly basis now of just like some new angle to cannabis, some new facet, and I can't help but wonder where we would be if 
we weren't stifled for decades right. and research wasn't stifled. Like where, where would we all be? Like would cannabis be integral to uh, traditional medicine? Would it be integral to uh, therapies, yeah. to athletics? Like it could be honestly like part of our everyday life in every facet yeah. and not just to say smoke weed every single day, yeah. but yeah. like it has an application for Absolutely probably something that everyone does if you know what i mean well yeah to that point it it uh it 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 can regulate homeostasis so you know that that that's what we need and in this current system of heightened stress and anxiety uh we need it more than ever Mm, mm, yeah i've seen some kind of harrowing statistics on like depression and uh, anxiety during COVID. It's obviously, a, like, obviously this is going to happen. People had to be locked down because of the virus, but at the same time, we're missing out on a lot of things. We're missing out on connection. We're missing out in some cases on sunlight, vitamin D, uh, routine. Like our routines are now changed to be more solitary, to be more indoors and staring at screens which none of this is really ideal we were already kind of heading in this direction pre-covid and this has just kind of accelerated it um so i can definitely see the need or um application for cannabis arising more now than it had previously even though i think still there's a lot of cases where cannabis would have been necessary pre-covid yeah yeah absolutely well, we can just be thankful for where we're at and that it's being studied now and being legalized in, in more and more increasingly more countries around the world. Yeah, I agree. Mm. Yeah, it is coming to an end, which is good. Um, Australia, unfortunately, is taking its time, but we'll, we'll get there. We'll catch up to you guys. Um, Andrew, what is on the horizon for you? What, what have you got planned in terms of your band, in terms of cannabis and your work? What can, what can people look forward to? Well, um, increasingly more, I, yeah, th- this, this is worth saying, like um, most of the clients that I see that are coming to me for any number of, um, of, of symptoms, medical symptoms, issues, um, I typically encourage people towards oils as opposed to smoking just because of the detrimental health effects on our body of, uh, from smoking. So increasingly, um, I, I, I rarely smoke anymore. I mostly just take an oil. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm, my plan is to continue to uh, use the, the inspirational and healing powers of the cannabis plant to continue to uh, write meaningful lyrics um that speak to uh the the current state of of the world um in an effort to uh continue to promote love in the world and fraternity and tolerance and equal rights and justice all the things that matter um and continue to create and produce and release uplifting spiritually minded hypnotic reggae music um i think it's a really you were just talking about you know where would we be if we could if we had had cannabis legalized and and been able to study it over the years well and in a similar sense i think that reggae music is integrally important to humankind at this time uh, for creating positive vibrations and an uplifting, encouraging message of hope. I don't know any other music like it that speaks to, that talks about love in particular um, and equal rights and, rights and social justice issues. So, yeah, I think it's, it's truly important. Um, so in, in both ca- capacities, I feel like I'm doing important work. Um, I'm closing in on finishing my seventh album currently, and um, we're looking to release that this summer. Uh, the album is called Weather the Storm, appropriately. 
and uh, yeah, I, I, it's my hope that that people will find inspiration in in the music. Brilliant. Well, that was beautiful, Andrew, and uh, I look forward to it. I look forward to hearing the the next album, and I wish you luck on on your professional and artistic journey. Thanks very much. It was a pleasure to speak with you and to meet you, man. Yeah, you too. The pleasure was all mine. Respect. All right. Thanks, Andrew. That is another episode wrapped up, this time with Andrew Branch, the cannabis counselor and band member of Halfway Tree. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Canmar Morning Talk Show. And as always, be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Canmar Events, as well as our Canmar Community Hub on LinkedIn, which will allow you to network with influencers, experts, and professionals alike. As always, Canmar is committed to bringing you endless opportunities. 